living in um, Bombay, and 3,000 people came to hear me speak. And I burst into tears, because I couldn't actually imagine 3,000 people wanting to come and hear me speak. But you must never forget, and people say to me, is it a strange Jeffrey? You travel all the way to India, you get all these people come to see you. Not this meeting, you get these people coming to see you. And the answer is, imagine being an author who nobody comes to hear, or nobody wants a book signed, or nobody reads. So I am very aware that it's a tremendous privilege. I apologize by starting in this way. It's just because I had a very nice Chinese meal in the Chinese restaurant downstairs. But because of you lot, and you are to blame, not me, I, uh, I only got past the first course. Because that's all, that's all he could manage. He was preparing it so carefully. I never got to the second course. But it was very good, and I'm going to go back there this evening and try again. And finish the course. Try it, try it, try it, try it. So, now, I find with groups of the people that, I, I mean, I can chat up two hours, three hours if you want me to. It's not a problem at all. But I find, so I'm not going to talk for long, because I like to hear your questions, because they guide me as to where we want to go and what you really want to know about. Because uh, India is different to every country on Earth. And I'll tell you why. We have to publish all the books, all my books, and I'm sure it's true for every other author, in India first. We have to be published in India, number one. So when people say that the, the Times of India came out saying 50 million people had read Cain and Abel in India. 50 million people in India had read Cain and Abel. Yes, I said, but not 50 million people have paid me <laughs> to read Cain and Abel. Because half of them were stolen. And the other difference in this country, the other big difference from England or America, 2.3 people read a book in Britain. 2.4 people read a book in the United States. The average in India is 12 people read every book. It goes around villages, it goes around families. I've seen more worn out Cain and Abel's in this country than I have faded, worn out, falling apart Cain and Abel's than any, any other country on earth. And that's wonderful too. Because people say, you see I was interviewed by um, the Wall Street Journal about 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. And the guy said to me, do you realize more people read you in India than America? And I said, I said, I've seen the figures. You know, I sell millions of books in America. No, 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 I didn't say that, he said. I said, more people read you in India than in the United States of America. So I didn't believe this even when he went through the figures with me until I traveled to Bombay about, Mumbai about, 10, 12 years ago, and 3,000 people came to hear me speak. It was the first time I actually believed it, that actually in India were all these people reading Cain and Abel, who I'd never thought about. Because always I only thought about India is, you know, how England beat you at cricket. That was the only thing. No? Uh, good try. <laughs> well, it was a good try this morning. It was looking good this morning. Um, and so I had this new image of India. And what I also discovered was the tremendous... Um, not only a tremendous reading group in this country, compared with almost any country on earth, but the young, and I mean the very young, are big readers too. In that audience in Bombay, the average age was 25. And there were 13, 14, 15 year olds who'd read. One 14 year old came up afterwards when I was signing books. I signed books for five hours. I was almost carried home. One boy, one boy came up and said, uh, and he was grumbling about one of the books, Paths of Glory, which he liked, but he was grumbling about it. And I said, oh, don't get so fussed. There are lots of other books for you to read. He said, I've read them all, age 14. And there was one girl, age 14. God, I'll never forget her. She'd written her own book already at 14 and had it published. And she came up on stage with me and she stood on stage with me and I presented her to the crowd. And I could see she was extremely bright and going to be. So I had a word with her afterwards. Her parents were there. And they were standing looking a bit shy of this very clever girl who was lecturing the audience at the age of 14. 
So I sat with her and said, you know, you're going to have a problem. I said, you are very clever and pretty as well. This is going to be a problem, I said, because men will turn out to be a problem. She said, age 14, men, they're a complete waste of time. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I can see where India is going. <laughs> India is going to be dominated by women for the next 50 years. By particularly, I, I could see this quite true. In my mind, I could see this 14-year-old now. So this was a, a tremendous thrill for me to come to a country I thought I knew and knew nothing about at all and meet people I thought I knew and, and I thought, no, no. And it's such a, contra a country of contrast for this Englishman staring at you. I, I, I leave this hotel, the Taj group, I've not stayed in any other, so I can't compare. But the Taj is, is better than anything we have in England. The Taj group as a group is better than any group we have in England. But I will go from this hotel and I will travel out to see a group of entrepreneurs this morning asked to see me, a group of uh, businessmen, only two women in the audience businessmen and the contrast to see children on the side of the streets who have no hope at all. This is for me terrible because there could be just as much talent hidden on the side of the streets but not getting an education. And very wisely my two advisors there said it was much much worse 20 years ago Jeffrey and it'll be much, much better in 20 years' time. So one at least had that as a joy. But it, of course, shocks you when you're, perhaps not you, but it shocks you a bit when you're sitting in a car and you see it hitting you in the face. Because it's just as possible if this country is going to produce a Mozart, if this country is going to produce a Picasso, maybe they're sitting on the side of the street now. Just nothing to do. Talent. God doesn't give talent to people who are well-dressed or whichever cot they're born in. He gives it without discretion. And so I've always believed that I've never believed in equality. I've only ever believed in equality of opportunity. Let every child have a chance to do what they want to do. Oh, and as I, have, I have been writing now for 35 years. And, all, and, and I think I've written 17 books. But at the age of 70, I decided to set myself a challenge because I need to, I'm a very focused human being. I'm a very driven human being. So I needed to set myself a challenge at the age of 70. And I said, I'm going to write five books in a row called the Clifton Chronicles that will take young Harry Clifton from 1920 and his birth through to 2020 when he will die. And it was going to be, it was going to be 20 years, a book, very neat, very tidy, all arranged. And that was to drive me, that was to focus me. Problem was, the first book had to take in the war. And that couldn't do that in 20 years, it took four years. And the second book, I thought, well, I better move along a bit. But that only took 11 years. And now I finished the third book. And that only took 11 years as well. So I'm afraid someone who said it's a trilogy, I mean, it may be six or seven for all I know, because I actually don't know myself yet. So if I don't know, how can you know? I haven't got a clue. I finished the third book and handed it in, and I think I know where the fourth book is going. But I start writing that on January the 1st. So it's still fermenting in my mind and trying to get itself out. So that's where I am for the next uh, five years. That's what uh, I'm up to. And uh, I, this is where I'm going to stop because I'm going to listen to your questions and because they will guide me into what interests you. But can I thank you very much for coming to hear me. That's very kind of you and say what fun it's been. And as I said at the beginning, I apologize for having been two minutes late. Thank you. Do you think Sachin should retire? Do I think Sachin Tendulkar should retire? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you stumped. He was stumped. Lord Jeffrey Archer, you've been stumped. Sachin Tendulkar should retire. Tendulkar. Oh, three years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Sachin Tendulkar is a god. Yes. Absolute god. Now, this is not for print. Are you a newspaper? Hmm. No, yes. this is not for printing. This is not for printing. Otherwise, I'll just say something that is wrong. Sachin Tendulkar is God. I saw him play in, in, at the Oval at the age of 17. 
I saw him catch a catch on the move. I saw Kapaldev standing in the background, and the look on Kapaldev's face was absolute total disbelief. So we knew we were in the presence of a genius. I hate these in getting out for twos and three years' time, because he's clearly a very great cricketer. Uh, my favorite over the years, I think probably is Roald Dravid. I just wrote the draw. I think it's Dravid because I just love the way, I love his style. I loved his style. But he went, you see, he retired. BBS Lexman, retired. Got to do it at the right time. Got to what retire. So Ralph? Oh, he's all right. Gangrel, all right. Yeah. No, you've got to have all heroes. Said all. You've got to have heroes. My, and Cumbly. I love Cumbly. Yeah. The way Cumbly behaved in Australia yeah. was an example to cricketers throughout the world. I came here to talk about books. <laughs> Next question. Do you have a structure already in your mind when you start writing a book? Do you have the story already there developed in your mind? Or it develops once you start writing the book? If you do that, you're a writer. I haven't got a clue. I reckon I've got three or four pages in my mind, and then I pray and see where it goes. And it takes me, takes me, takes me, takes me. I've never had a letter in 30 years, 40 years. I've never had a letter saying, oh, I knew how it was going to end. Yeah, I could see it on page 200. If I don't know how it's going to end, how can you know how it's going to end? And sometimes I don't know how it's going to end with 10 pages to go. I am a storyteller. It comes out every... Now, I confess to you that I'm terrified that one day he will say, you've had enough, Jeffrey. I'm stopping. <laughs> and I won't be able to ever do it again. I'm terrified of that. But so far, every single day, it just comes and comes and comes. As long as I've got Cain and Abel, the story of two boys born on the same day, one with everything, one with nothing, go. She only stopped screaming when she died. It was then that he started to scream. Yeah. And then you pray. Yeah. What will be the next sentence? The young man, the young boy rushing through the forest had never heard a scream like that before. No animal screamed like that. What will be the next sentence? You're praying all the time. But if you know all the time, you're a writer, not a storyteller. And I've heard somewhere that uh, you love to compare yourself with, uh, I want to ask you that what are the similarities do you find with him, actually? Uh, one with of them, who? Peter, Peter Pan. Pan. Peter Pan, sir. Peter, Peter Pan. Pan. And then someone suggested that. Yes, yes. Sure. What are the similarities do you find with him uh, and you? I think, no, well, no, someone suggested I was Peter Pan. I, I can find one uh, with Oh, can you? Thank you. <laughs> that, uh, you never grow old like him. It's ah, sure. that's very kind. Uh, very kind. Uh, well, no, I'm very aware now. I, I'm a, if I was your age, I wouldn't be aware of mortality, <laughs> but I am aware of it now. <laughs> I've become very aware of it. Um, I think energy keeps you young. I think if you have, and I think, by the way, energy is a gift. I don't think you can go down to boots and get a packet of energy. <laughs> uh, I don't think you can. I think you, it's a, it's a God-given gift like anything else. And if you have energy plus the ability to write a book or the ability to tell us, the ability to paint a picture or the ability to sing or the ability to play a violin, you're very, very lucky because then you've got, because energy being that important. I'm utterly convinced that, uh, well, I always tell school children when I, when, I, when I lecture in schools, I always say, energy, plus talent, you're a king. But talent with no energy, you'll be a pauper. Um, any chance of India featuring your other plots? No. And why not? No, and why not? Yes. Don't write about something you don't know anything about. You still don't? Write about, if you're going to write a book, by all means write the great Indian novel. I was reading, I can't even pronounce his name, I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. Who was I reading at lunch? Rabindranath Tagore. I can't even pronounce it correctly. Tagore is easy. Sorry? Tagore. Just say Tagore, right. Tagore. 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 I was reading him at lunch today. This will make you laugh when I say this because it's just as I say it. It is so Indian that I could never do that. And while I was, 
watching how he played with sentences, brilliant. How he played with words, brilliant. But also the way he talked about Indians. He understood them and he made me laugh about what I've seen but never would have been able to put on paper. His view of different India it was fascinating. He couldn't do that about Englishmen because he wouldn't get the same feel that I have. So, no, I'll never write an Indian novel. I've written an Indian short story, very tragic short story, which I picked up from a director of Tata, Mr. son of a Maharaja, who married someone of a lower caste than himself. Remarkable story. But he, they both told me. They told me the story, and I have written that. But the story was so strong that I was able to get away with it, but I couldn't get away with it in a novel. No. Yeah. What do you read? My favorite authors are pretty well all storytellers. I love uh, Jumar. I think he's the great storyteller of his generation. And people forget that he wrote The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers in the same year. I mean, what a man. Mind you, no television in those days, no frenetic life in those days. But still, to write two masterpieces in one year is still pretty remarkable. I love Jane Austen because I think she proves to every human being alive, and we haven't had a question yet about ideas, but here is a woman born in a small village in England who writes in her bedroom so that no one can spot her writing. She doesn't want her father or her mother to know she's a writer. She writes a story about four women, four young girls looking for a husband, and when she's finished that book, she writes a story about three young girls looking for a husband. And when she's finished that book, she writes a story about two young girls looking for a husband. And then when she's finished that book, she writes Emma, the story of a young woman looking for a husband. Now, four books on the same subject. She can't put them down. You have to turn the page. And she proves to us all you don't have to be born in India or London or Chicago. You can be born in a tiny village. And you should write about what you know about. Because the people will then, when they read it, go, she knows about this. But of course she has an amazing gift. She would great story. Hmm? Which are the plays that you love? I asked the great Sadeli Rowland, Ryland, which was the greatest play he'd ever written. So I know what the world's expert on Shakespeare thinks. Though I'm not in, we, we all have our own. Lear is unquestionable in the experts' minds, the greatest play he ever wrote. But I have, I, I love Richard II, which very few people do. Mm -hmm. And we've got a young actor in England called Ben Winchlaw, who's just played it, and it's just, you can't get to the theatre. You can't get anywhere near, he's so good. You've probably seen him in, uh, in the latest Bond film. He's playing Q, Q in the latest <laughs> Bond film. You wait till you see him play Richard II. Oh. Mm -hmm. I love Midsummer Night's Dream. But what I always say about Shakespeare is I want you all to imagine for a moment you have never read a word of Shakespeare. Okay? Because people ask me what would you like most, Jeffrey, other than a daughter, I always say, to have all my knowledge of Shakespeare removed. Why, they say. Can you imagine reading Romeo and Juliet and not knowing the ending? Every one of you in the room knows the ending. But imagine if you didn't know the ending. What is going to happen to this girl? What is going to happen to this boy? What is going to happen, full stop? He is a hell of a storyteller. But of course, because we know the plays so well, we all know the ending of every one of them. So in a way, I mean, I read Romeo and Juliet on a train on the way to London from Western at the age of 12, 13, I don't know how old I was. And it's ruined it for me. Because it wasn't until years later that I understood the play. Or as the great Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench said, when offered the part to play the nurse in Romeo and Juliet, when I think she was 65, she was offered the part to play the nurse, she said, I'm just ready to play Juliet. <laughs> I mean, that's how great the master is. Sorry, that's nothing to do with me. Next. Uh, sir, many of your books have a touch of you in your book, your life, 
Is this a conscious effort that you make? No, not an effort, but I was saying before you came, so you missed it. <laughs> I don't mind asking. Now, you know, you don't, you don't seem at all embarrassed. <laughs> I'm full of admiration for the way you can just bat me off with a smile. <laughs> you must write about what you know about, because the person reading it will say, he knows what he's talking about. And I gave an example, in a restaurant the other day, and I saw the most amazing episode. Now, if that comes up in the book, I'll write it exactly as I saw it. I will steal the whole thing and put it in the book. I won't invent it. I won't make the people in the restaurant different. And if I was to write about a room like this, and the people in the room like this, I would steal it wholesale. What's the point? So, Always use your own experiences, whatever it is, whatever. Do you know, if, if you're in design, write about design. If you're in hairdressing, write about hairdressing. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as the reader wants to turn the page. R.K. Narayan writes stories about a little village with a local tax man or local, and you have to turn the page. Why do you have to turn the page? Because he's a wonderful storyteller, and he's a damn good writer. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Oh, okay. okay. And somebody, if you want to. Yes. 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 The way you talked about India, yes, in and especially about the driving, I think you can do a good work by being observant about the things. You know a little bit about India. Only a little. <laughs> good enough for us. And I love India. Too. No, but the way you said, it gives a totally new insight in the, our driving. How we drive, we never notice this way. <laughs> It's because you live here. Don't bend them. Don't bend them. Uh, come back when everyone's had their books signed. Uh, yeah. yep. Can we have an open at the right page, please? You've got a baby of three months old. And you like it. It's a great story. Sure. Sure. She couldn't. Emma's the big star in my latest book. Okay. Yes. What do you mean, okay? <laughs> okay. Jane must have got there first. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. And then she went to Trinity. And then she gave it all up to go on the board of the hospital. And Anna Bruce. Yeah, she made the decision. She was a scientist. Yes. She was a scientist. She made the decision at the age of 40. She got out of bed. I'll never forget it. I'm, I'm resigning this morning. And I said, why? You're, you know, you're at Trinity. How can you resign? She said, I've got to do something else. Scientists are dead at 40. Six months later, she was on the board of the books. And she had seven years as a director, three years as deputy chairman, ten years as chairman. And last year she won Best Hospital in Britain. Yeah. She's very proud of that. She won Best Hospital in Britain. And the Queen made her a day. But, so she decided at the age of 40, I mentioned this, she decided at the age of 40 to go in a totally different direction, do a second career, which I think your generation will do a lot to know. My father would just call me womb to tomb. Yeah. Collect the gold watch, call it a day. I think your generation may do three jobs. Certainly two. I mean, I met a lot of barristers. You're going in the law. You're going in the. You're going in the law. I'll tell you, I know Michael Bella is one of my dearest and closest friends. And a lot of barristers I've known who I've They kind of wish they'd done it until the age of 40, 45.